This is that place in the conference day where if you chat outside now, you have less time to drink at the other end. So, you know, this is where you want everybody to come on in. Uh, I, uh, I, 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 I did not think that the 11th anniversary of SFLC was terribly important. Uh, which was why I didn't think I was going to hold a meeting this year, but the stars were in alignment uh, everywhere else. Uh, the 30th anniversary of the Free Software Foundation uh, is uh, a, a very tender moment for me, after all, and for pretty much everybody else who's ever been part of the free software movement. Uh, and a decade of OIN is a, 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 a thing to be marked in the deepest way. And having been watching SFLC.in grow uh, and uh, begin uh, to shape what we're going to be like as a free software movement in the largest software making society on earth, as well as the largest society on earth, as well as the largest democracy on earth, I hope, uh, is also uh, a, 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 an anniversary of, of great importance. So it seemed to me that the right place to begin uh, this afternoon was by forgetting entirely about the 11th anniversary of SFLC, a number of no importance unless you think ones are lucky or something, uh, and uh, to concentrate instead elsewhere. Uh, my contribution to all of this is the essay looking backward at, SF at FSF's legal strategy uh, over the last 22 years, which is uh, carefully buried somewhere in the middle of the uh, unpaginated mass of uh, CLE materials and other documents around here. Uh, I hope uh, now that I have uh, begun making the various corrections that Richard wants made that we can all publish this and put it out pretty soon at, at GNU.org and FSF.org and at SFLC. Um, so I have nothing more to contribute to this conversation uh, but to ask Keith and Mishy and uh, John Sullivan to come and talk about the birthdays that are really worth uh, celebrating. In this image Mishy set up of the parties going on, this is the birthday parties. If uh, you would all please come up, I, I, I'd be very grateful. Uh, in seniority terms, um, that means uh, you're the oldest guy here, so you will start, John, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, and I'm going uh, to get out of the way. We will do this 30, 10, 5, and um, I'll be gone. Excuse me while I um, do this presentation from my fully free notebook here. Well, that was a little bit funny. Uh, it's nice to see um, SFLC using fully free notebooks, actually, uh, in the back there for the uh, streaming audio video work that they're doing. Um, and we do have those to do our work normally at the FSF. I just happen to be a, a fan of paper for a lot of uses still. Uh, so I want to thank Eben and Mishi uh, and the rest of the SFLC crew. Um, for giving me an opportunity to talk about this occasion for the FSF. Uh, and want to congratulate um, both Keith and uh, Mishi and Evan on the anniversaries of OIN and SFLCIN and, and SFLC 11 years is remarkable, even if it's uh, not a magical number. Um, we turned 30 on October 4th. Uh, I've been at the FSF uh, only since 2003, so less than half of that. Uh, but we did have people at our celebration that had been aware of the FSF and had been involved for all 30 years. It was really awesome to see. Uh, we also, I also don't want to let this go by without uh, noting some of the other important 30th anniversaries that have happened this year. Uh, for example, the release of Microsoft Windows 1.0, <laughs> same year. Uh, discovery of the RMS Titanic, no relation, uh, also the same year. So. And we celebrated the event, uh, the occasion in Boston in two ways. We had a, a daytime event, which was, we called a user freedom summit, um, and then an evening celebration, which was much more uh, mature and moderate than my own 30th birthday celebration. Uh, but the program, I thought, for the daytime summit in particular gave a, a nice way to talk about um, where the FSF is and, and where we're headed over the next 30 years. So uh, there were four sessions. Um, and each one kind of represents an area of our work. But the interesting thing here is that 
none of those sessions were run by exclusively FSF uh, staff members. They were all done in collaboration with community contributors and volunteers, which I think is also an important comment on how we've gotten where we are and how we've lasted 30 years and, and also where we'll get the strength to continue the rest of our mission from. Uh, the first one was uh, called Community Licensing Education and Outreach. The second was Introduction to Federation. The third was Dip a Toe in Crypto, clearly the best title. And the fourth was Libra Boot, a talk and demonstration. So the licensing portion we've uh, talked about uh, this morning on the panel a lot uh, already, but I want to emphasize that a big part of our work has been and will continue to be promoting copyleft. You know, we say that all free software is good uh, and ethical to distribute, whether it's under a copyleft license or a license that allows other people to redistribute it um, on their proprietary terms. But only copyleft software is actually truly secure. Only copyleft, uh, copyleft software in the sense of security, that only copyleft software can secure our freedoms going forward. We've already seen uh, Android in 2011 for a short period of time uh, not being distributed as free software, except for the parts which were copyleft and had to be. Um, that was eventually rectified, but there was a period of time there where we had a small taste of what it was like if uh, somebody like Google changed their minds and decided to stop sharing future versions under a free license. That's a scary place to be, and I think we really need copyleft licenses to build the foundation uh, of future work. Um, uh, also, we need to not just talk about copyright licenses, but we need to think about other licensing related issues like patents. Uh, free software and computer user freedom will never be safe, no matter what the copyright situation is, or as long as uh, software ideas are patentable. Uh, any one program can be uh, the victim, can be covered by you know dozens, sometimes hundreds of patent claims. Um, so at the FSF, we've recently started the process of rebooting our campaign to uh, argue that software is not patentable, um, or at the very least, find other strategies to completely disarm software patents so that free software developers and users uh, don't have to worry about threats from this area. That's definitely going to be a big part of the next 30 years. We've already seen it be a huge part of the last several years with decisions at the federal and Supreme Court levels. But licensing for us isn't really uh, the core of our work, um, as much as sometimes it's the core of what we talk about. It's a means, uh, it's a strategy, it's a tool. You know, it's a, it's a necessity because we have to have licenses to protect us from other from existing parts of the legal regime, you know, the way that default copyright works, the way that patent claims work. Uh, we need licenses to defend ourselves using legal tools against legal threats. But ultimately, this is a subset of our advocacy work. And, uh, you know, when I was talking earlier about the fact that if everybody just released their software as free software, we wouldn't have to worry about compliance. I didn't mean that literally in the sense that all software, license, free software licenses are compatible with each other. But if you look at different free software licenses, their differences relate to uh, their re desired relationship to proprietary software that is near them. So I think that in the end, in our utopian world, you know, we don't really worry about licensing because all software is free, not just as in released under a license that's listed on the FSF site, but free as in released under just ethical terms that allow complete sharing, modification, and examination. The second session was federation. Uh, and you know, the license of the software doesn't matter if you don't even have access to the software at all. So we're seeing uh, more and more of computing being done on servers that are uh, not under a computer, not under the user's control at all. So it doesn't matter how much of the software on Facebook server is free software because you can't change Facebook software. Uh, only Facebook can change Facebook software. All you can do is log into their site and use it the way that they allow you to use it. So this session was about how to return in that world, you know, how to return control back to the users. And uh, licensing is part of that solution. The AGPL, the AFERO uh, General Public License, is uh, a way, part of the solution. It requires that if you use uh, free AGPL license software uh, on your server that you share the source code for that. Um, but obviously that's kind of hard to verify if you don't have access to the server. And uh, it doesn't necessarily, doesn't mean that the user can install their own changes on your server. That would be kind of strange. So it gives us network software to build on, but it doesn't necessarily um, address all of the threats. So the rest of our solution to that issue is to actually bring control over computing back to uh, computer users. And basically what this means is decentralized free software solutions that achieve, you know, that have the same features, essentially, that people are using centralized software for. You know, there are solutions uh, like 
GNU Media Goblin uh, and GNU Social are two that I want to highlight where we're making significant progress. GNU Media Goblin is a, a federated, uh, decentralized system, federated like email. You can have one server talk to another server. You don't have to all be using Gmail in order to send somebody a message at gmail.com. Uh, it's a system to exchange uh, media photos, so to replace things like YouTube, Flickr, uh, parts of Facebook, Instagram. Um, and Media Goblin is licensed under the AGPL, and anybody can run their own instance of it and talk to instances that other people are running. You can actually watch uh, Eben's closing talk from the User Freedom Summit on our Media Goblin server at media.libreplanet.org. I'll give you a little bit of a taste of how it works. So we raise funds for Media Goblin, um, and it's been exciting to see the progress that's been made there. Uh, soon we'll also be raising funds for GNU Social, which is also AGPL licensed software that aims to replace uh, the more you know, microblogging communication part of things like Twitter um, and Facebook with a similar decentralized approach. Um, some of you may have seen this operating in the past uh, as Identica, uh, which for quite a while uh, made, uh, was, was greatly popular and showed a lot of potential. So these things together enable actual social networking between free individuals. You know, rather than uh, what we could call siloed networking for the purpose of selling advertising for other people. Um, and as excited as people are about the potential of the internet for communication and social networking, um, we need to bring control over that from the privacy settings to the security uh, to the software that runs on your own machine um, to the data that's stored back to users. Uh, freedom on the network is also related to this but different. You know, we have numerous instances where people are actually being required to use proprietary software to participate on the network at all. Um, for the FSF specifically, this means issues like keeping DRM, uh, digital restrictions management, out of the HTML5 standard. You know, we have a big push from companies like Netflix, uh, Google, Apple to replace the very inconvenient Flash plugin with something more convenient but still proprietary by getting a standard for DRM control over what you can do with the media that you watch, read, download, built into uh, HTML5 so that <coughs> standards compliant browsers will want to support that. Uh, also JavaScript, you know, we uh, visiting sites like Facebook, lots of places actually results in software being sent to your computer and run on your local machine as proprietary software. It's a program written in JavaScript. It doesn't run on Facebook server. It actually runs on your computer. So of course for us that raises all the same ethical issues as uh, any other piece of software running on your system like your word processor uh, or uh, your graphic editing program. So those two issues are examples of places that over the next several years we're going to have to fight for the, free, the ability of users who want to use free software to still be able to participate as full citizens on the network. You know, even while we also work to encourage everybody to be uh, one of those kinds of users. And under this heading of uh, federation, I also want to include the mobile area, specifically replicants, um, which is the version of uh, free, a version of Android supported by the FSF. Uh, and while the core of Android is maintained uh, as, and distributed as free software, uh, any Android device that you walk into a store and actually buy comes loaded with all kinds of proprietary software. And any of the hardware out there uh, actually requires proprietary bits in order to make functions like Wi-Fi, GPS, and Bluetooth uh, work. So Replicant is a project that seeks to take the Android base and make it work on as many platforms as possible without using any of the proprietary parts. So Replicant is what powers my uh, phone and stopwatch here. Um, you know, we live without a lot of features right now, but it does work for day-to-day -day use just fine. Um, we're excited to see it being expanded to more platforms, and we expect that to be a, a serious part of the, uh, our approach to the obvious need for more free software in the mobile space over the next several years. And I include that under the network heading because I think the mobile devices and the network problem are very intimately related. You know, like what percentage of activities that people do on their mobile devices are actually tied to some server? You know, like Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Whisper. And, you know, that's a huge part of what people do, and I think as we start to tackle one, each side of that, in turn, we're going to find new solutions, you know, to the opposite way. If you're to the opposite side, if you're using Media Goblin for your media, you're going to have a different kind of application on your phone than you would if you used Instagram 
In fact, you might need to have dozens of different applications to do all these little specific silo activities. You might be able to have uh, just one or two that can actually communicate uh, over all sorts of different protocols. So I like the idea of tackling these two solutions, these two problem areas together and seeing where that gets us. So the third area of uh, tip of toe and crypto, um, you know, the abuse of surveillance that was revealed by Edward Snowden over a couple of years ago and all of the developments that we've seen since then have given us a great hook. Uh, I mean, not to celebrate them, not to wish for that, but uh, created a, a moment for us to talk about free software. Suddenly people were aware that their computers and that the network was doing things that they didn't like uh, and that they had no control over. So we've worked really hard to engage that in the media to make sure that free software is uh, talked about as part of the solution to that uh, and as also proprietary software being talked about as part of the problem because it enabled hiding you know, many of the bits of, bits of uh, software used by surveillance agencies. Um, but I've also found in approaching this issue that free software supporters don't all agree on what level of privacy individuals have a right to expect. You know, this is within the United States, but this is also a reflection of the fact that free software is a global movement. Uh, different cultures, different countries have very different views of, of what kind of privacy people should expect. Uh, so it's, you know, that's an interesting division, but the one thing that they all do agree on is that whatever the level is, you need to have free software in order to be able to control that. You know, if you're using proprietary software, somebody else is in control of your level of privacy because they can put things into programs that you're not aware of. Uh, so whatever the level you think it is, unless of course you think it's none, in which case uh, I guess free software is not a good solution, um, uh, it's a precondition for achieving that level of privacy. So we're doing a lot to help users get started using free software, uh, specifically in privacy protecting areas. We launched a site called emailselfdefense.fsf.org that teaches people how to get started using GNU Privacy Guard, the encryption program that was used by Edward Snowden and Glenn Greenwald uh, to encrypt their own email. And you can try it. Uh, you can talk to a bot that we have available over email to test out your setup. The bot's name is Edward, of course, uh, and is also licensed under the AGPL. Um, and the last area I want to touch on is uh, Libreboot. So that was the last session, and uh, Libreboot is the name of the project within Coreboot that uh, seeks to replace the proprietary boot firmware on computers, and that's laptops, servers, desktops. Uh, we, for years, we've been able to have a mostly free laptop, you know, a laptop where all of the stuff after the machine boots was free software, but we never could endorse uh, a laptop at the FSF because everyone still came with a proprietary piece of software under the operating system uh, that was necessary to get all the hardware actually started. Libreboot now addresses that and enables us to, has enabled us to certify a few laptop, laptops starting with the X60, X200, um, and some more on the way that can actually run fully free software all the way from the moment you turn it on. And it's been the center of our, one of the programs I'm most excited about, our Respects Your Freedom hardware certification program. And I think you'll see a lot of activity from us in this area over the next, uh, in, in the near future and in the long term. Part of our struggle is to get people to actually care about uh, free software, to, to understand that they can actually demand certain kinds of freedoms. Uh, and then the other part of that is to enable them to care. So the Respects Your Freedom program puts a clear mark on, so on products packaging that says we've certified it to respect end user, to respect your freedom, that it only comes with free software, only requires free software, uh, won't ever ask you to install anything proprietary. So that way, once a person decides they support this, you know, the success of this program means they'll be able to walk into a store, go online, whatever, and order a product that has been evaluated already. Uh, and we've managed to certify so far the laptops I mentioned, plus the home Wi-Fi router, which sold out as soon as we certified it, um, various uh, USB devices for Wi-Fi, uh, 3D printers. Um, so I think it's uh, very exciting stuff, and it's a really important part of what we need to be doing. And people want it. You know, you can look at projects like Bunny Huang's Novena laptop, uh, which raised $783,000 after asking for a goal of $250,000. You can look at uh, Purism's Libra M laptop, which currently is not a, a free machine fully, but the company is marketing it with the goal of getting it there based on the resources that they've raised, and people responded to that message. So Purism raised... Uh, 545,000 over their $250,000 goal. So 
So there's clearly a demand for this. You know, people really do want it, and I look forward to being able to certify more products and work with uh, companies like this to help um, bring those to market. So that's just a selection of what we do um, with the support of our donors, you know, both individual members and, and corporate patron contributors. Uh, but another thing that I'm really putting a lot of emphasis on this year for us is to take stock of the things that we're actually doing. We have 30 years of, of work and expectations accumulated, and it's, it's uh, definitely a good moment to sit back and say, you know, what, are, what metrics, what outcomes are we using to measure each of these initiatives? How do we prioritize them? Uh, what are the things that need to be handled first since we can't uh, reasonably expect to handle all of them at the same time? Um, so over 30 years, the FSF has introduced free software to literally millions of people. Uh, and billions of dollars have been made from that software. And it's a very humbling thing to be a part of and really exciting. Uh, some days we can be really discouraged, you know, by the fact that when Amazon deleted copies of the book 1984 from people's Kindles remotely, that there wasn't an instant revolution. You know, that was uh, kind of discouraging. Um, but on the other hand, we can be really encouraged uh, by the way the free software continues to become uh, more and more ubiquitous. We just have to move it from the layer of, you know, the foundation, the out of sight, out of mind stuff that powers, you know, the kernel, uh, the network, you know, all of these building blocks that people actually depend on and help bring at that last step to actually be in front of individual users and, and help them be empowered and free. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as I said earlier in one of my uh, comments, the beginnings of my uh, in-depth association with the community really started here, and it was a different room, by the way. Um, and uh, it was a uh, uh, just an eye-opening experience to kind of sit and listen to a day's presentations from a variety of people, uh, the, the SFLC team as well as others from uh, all around the community. And it was uh, it was when I was evaluating the opportunity to come on board to uh, to steward OIN, and uh, it was uh, it was certainly one of the the I'd say the more formative activities that I did while uh, evaluating that opportunity. And uh, so I thank uh, Eben, uh, Mishi, and uh, and the entire team at SFLC for for being here. Uh, I often uh, say that uh, if uh, if SFLC didn't exist, we'd have to recreate it um, because the necessity doesn't come in, in you know every minute of every day, but it's the, you recognize how it's embedded in the fabric of, of creating value and making things better for all of the entities, be they uh, not-for-profits or for-profits that participate in the community. Um, I had the 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 good fortune to have a uh, built in enough time to spend a little bit of time with Richard and, and, and John in, at their 30th. Uh, and uh, it was also, I arrived there in the transition between the morning or the afternoon session and the evening celebration. And I had a chance to be able to fly on the wall when people were coming in and setting up. And, and I really had a sense of the diversity of just the the FSF team and the community, and I'm sitting there watching all these people working together seamlessly and incredible diversity of nationality, language, uh, but everything was working well. And then when when Richard came in, I was really taken with how uh, how calm and 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 uh, and and just focused he was, and how he'd obviously had a great day, and so uh, you know, he was really happy. With uh, with marking that the, the 30 years and probably no doubt and John can answer this the question probably is he, he was reflecting on on a lot of the things that have been accomplished. I don't think that's necessarily you know something that he does. Uh, looking back is not something that he impresses me as a person. He does on a regular basis, but it gave him an opportunity to do that because he's so focused on on kind of the future. And I think some of the things John just talked about remind me of how. You know, we think about projects and we think about a lot of innovation occurring at uh, large projects, for example, like Linux or like OpenStack or other projects that have come into being, hundreds of others. Um, but 
we should never forget that there's a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity that's being brought to bear on a regular basis, uh, whether it be on the legal front in entities like SFLC or whether it be on the on a practical technology development front uh, that's happening at the FSF. And, and uh, when we uh, had the formal announcement of our, our, our 10th anniversary, at OIN at uh, the Linux Foundation event in Dublin a few weeks back and uh, when I was raising a toast to to the people who had contributed to making OIN what it is which is essentially uh, all those participants who are active as developers, uh, coders, uh, users, vendors in the market, uh, I mean the first thing I thought about was that I'm standing on the shoulders of, of RMS and and others who have essentially established the groundwork for for open source to exist. And for me, it's from the first session that I participated in here as an observer, uh, now in 11 years, or uh, in 07, I guess, it was a, uh, it was always something that I came away with that we're participating in something that's so much larger than ourselves and has such an impact that you can't help, a word that John used, you can't help but be humbled when you are in, faced with the enormity of what we are collectively creating, the transformation in social values in, in the process through which we create value and innovate, where one plus one plus one doesn't equal three anymore, but it equals six or 10 or 20, because we are each standing on each other's shoulders in the development of, of technology. We're borrowing from each other, we're sharing with each other, we're bouncing ideas off of each other, and we're, we're at a fundamental level just better because of each other. And I think that's really, when I, when I spent time with Michael Cunningham, and who's the chairman of our board uh, and general counsel at Red Hat, and first, first talking about OIN, the, the, it was increasingly hitting me that what we're, what we're part of is this social movement and that while we have a license that we offer uh, to the world, um, and it's a free license, uh, that that license is really a vehicle to be able to create uh, effectively conforming or appropriate behavior for how companies utilize patents uh, in, the, in an open, open source world, an open and closed world, in the, in the free software environment that, that was authored 30 years ago. Uh, by uh, by RMS and and we live in the we live in the slipstream that he's created uh, to a great extent and I think it, that's never far from me and the fact that it's a cultural transformation is something that I particularly take pleasure in because cultural transformation social transformations are permanent it's not about whether you adopt one technology or another in fact the technologies that that we produce are a byproduct of the more powerful component of the of the, the modality and that's the piece that's always stayed with me and that is ever present every day when I'm out talking with people uh, when I'm socializing them this this the model that OIN's developed and the the elegance of the architects of it from from Red Hat, IBM, Novell, uh, Sony, NEC and Philips in, in authoring this entity and the uh, uh, the the, the the sense of uh, of commitment that they express not only with capital but with a model that that ushers in a a, a way of uh, of participating in a uh, in an open source world uh, you, while you can continue to utilize patents if you choose to uh, because we inherit a world that's contextually filled with patents uh, open source dropped into that world and it's basically through the the architecting of what uh, OIN is, we've created a vehicle for people to coexist regardless of what their views might be on patenting and for them to enable each other in the core of Linux and, and other open source functionality and, uh, and the, pro the project functionality that's produced by so many uh, rich and creative uh, resources. And so essentially what OIN has, has developed is what I'm most proud of. With 1,800 plus uh, licensees now, we've developed a community of interest where people recognize that where we cooperate, 
we don't sue each other where we rely on each other, and I think Dave used this term, interdependencies. That's a term I use all the time, because we rec once we recognize our interdependence, we recognize the folly of attempting to utilize patents to restrict uh, others from participating and making us better. That whole concept of making each other better is enabled by freedom of action and freedom to operate in the core. And so, in, in creating OIN, there was this fundamental awareness that, that of this notion that Ray Norda first talked about and applied to, uh, applied to the IT sector in, uh, in 90, 1992, uh, and the whole concept of coopetition, that we're cooperating and competing at the same time. We're not doing one and then the other, we're doing both at the same time. It's the reconciliation of binary opposites, the dealing with duality that's very challenging for some companies, and many companies are still, still having great difficulty doing that, uh, dealing with this duality of open and closed, uh, and, and reconciling their prior histories and their prior success with the future demands of participating in a world that is increasingly open source driven and collaboratively enabled. And so OAN's model is to uh, offer a free license to the patents. We've uh, had the good fortune, and I consider myself one of the most fortunate uh, leaders in, in this community uh, in leading an organization that is well-funded and supported by companies absolutely committed to freedom and to the growth of open source as a modality. Uh, we essentially have invested over $90 million in purchasing patents that we make available on a royalty-free basis to any company that participates in our community in an appropriate way. And what we define as an appropriate way is forbearing the right to sue on patents that are central and core to the Linux system, which is core Linux and, and other project functionality that is in fact core. Uh, and they agree that they, uh, they will provide a license to the patents that they own that are relevant to that Linux system to each and every other company who participates uh, where everyone is giving as good as they get. And so this incredible growth that we've had, we've doubled over the last four years, we've doubled in size twice the size of the community. Uh, we have grown in lockstep with, with the diffusion of open source technology. Uh, we started out in the enterprise space uh, in, the, in reaction in large part to uh, the SCO litigation, which was a, a series of a small company that had a series of Unix-based patents, and it was funded by Microsoft to uh, essentially mount a series of litigations to, with the design of slowing or stalling the progress of Linux in the enterprise. That, uh, that effort uh, proved to be far more... Uh, of an igniter of positive behaviors and unity uh, than I think Microsoft could have ever, uh, ever appreciated at the time. It got these six companies to get together to put in a significant amount of money to fight the fight, to not wait for every other company to join, but to create a model that invited other companies to join uh, through the whole notion that, again, we are better when we're together and we need to be unified uh, to be able to fight the, the battles that, that are potentially out there, that we see out there now, and those that could come about later in, in the history of, uh, of open source. And so, uh, again, I've had the great pleasure of, of working with an enlightened group of, of, uh, of companies, an enlightened group of board members, to be able to allow us to navigate to work when, when Microsoft was attempting to uh, essentially launder patents through uh, a, uh, uh, a, a patent management organization that acquires patents and then sells them to third parties when they were attempting to sell 22 uh, Linux, Linux patents complete with claim charts. Uh, we were able to work creatively with the community with many other tech companies to be able to intercept those patents and, and prevent Microsoft's strategy from playing out so that trolls, patent trolls didn't gain access to those patents. When we were confronted with the with litigation by Microsoft on Linux related uh, functionality against uh, uh, companies uh, in the community, we've been able to work together with the Linux Foundation, with SFLC, with FSF, FSFE, 
uh, as one to be able to affect a positive result. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really a unique situation when, uh, you know, I think because we offer something that's free, I tell people there's no analog in the history of technology uh, to what OIN is. And it's, uh, it's something that to grow into the largest patent, the patent non-aggression community in the history of technology is really something that, uh, that I think is powerful and meaningful, but we're a small part of, the, of, the, of, of what this grand experiment is that open source represents. And that small piece of, of it is, is to be the humble servant of a community that is investing billions of dollars every month, every year, in, in driving this modality to produce this new technology, whether it be for the auto space, it's an exciting time for the auto sector as we, we talk to companies like Toyota and Hyundai and BMW and Jaguar Land Rover and others that are at the point where they're adopting uh, platforms, whether it be a, a, a Tizen platform uh, or another open source platform to be able to create the digital DNA of the future of automobiles so that we move away from having uh, you know, dozens of proprietary systems control automobiles to having an open platform so that automobiles could become, become much more an, ex, an extension of the individuals and the humans that are, that are engaged, engaged in driving them. Uh, for now, we drive them. Maybe we won't drive them shortly if Google and Apple have their way. Um, but I think this, this whole movement and this whole activity has been, has been an enriching one, uh, and it's one where we have, we have a long way to go to, bring, to create the kind of community that we really strive for. We want many, many more larger companies to participate so we can neutralize the, the threats represented by patents that are held in their portfolios uh, as it pertains to the core of Linux and open source. And we want many more small to medium-sized companies and institutions to become part of this, uh, this, this social movement. And for our part of that is basically to create a culture where people recognize, uh, again, that simple concept that I stated earlier, where we collaborate, we don't sue each other, because we are interdependent in those, in those arenas. And we need to be able to build on each other to be better. And in the other environments uh, where we participate, we need to recognize that, uh, that at, if we behave well here, we will, we will look to work more collaboratively with the people that we are joined with on this, on this, this, this social experiment. And I think what we're looking to do is ameliorate tension across the board by having companies recognize their interdependencies, having them recognize, as, as you saw the panel up talking about copyright earlier, the, it can't be overstated how collaborative the lawyers are in this community. And I think it's, a, again, it's a reflection of how collaborative the technology people are. I think if we can get the business people to, to see what's really happening, how pervasive this is, then I think we're, we're very close to kind of optimizing the, the ability for individuals to work together to create the, be the best result. And we're doing so in a way that that's not just about North America or the G6 countries or the G8 countries or the G10 countries. The real power here is that we're spreading this contagion across the world and engaging people uh, where, wherever they are so that they can participate through networks to be able to add value to projects that are global. Uh, and that's another component that drives me is, the, is this globalization of this whole modality. And so I thank you as for those of you who are participating in OIN, for those of you that will participate in the future. Uh, OIN is, has, has had t a great 10-year run, but we have a long way to go because the threat landscape changes all the time. Uh, and we look to be able to anticipate those changes and work collaboratively with organizations like those that are represented here with me today to be able to affect a positive outcome so that there is a market, so there's an opportunity space, and that companies can participate, small, medium, large-sized companies, as well as individuals, in, in realizing their potential as, as innovators in, in society. So thank you. Thank you. So how many of you have those blue diaries? and blue pens.
Have you seen the mark on it? Do you know that it is not this Software Freedom Law Center, but a different mark? It's sflc.in, which is a different entity. And for those of you who don't know or who have trouble guessing where, which part of the United States I am, I'm actually from a different part of the world where everything is experienced, re-rendered in Technicolor, and it's India. And the organization is sflc.in, which has a license from Software Freedom Law Center to use its name and some other tangible, intangible assets. And that's the organization's diaries and pens you're going to be carrying or are already writing in. So um, in 2010, after having spent time in these classrooms, um, hopefully studying and learning something, but mostly partying, and at some time at SFLC, I went back to India, to New Delhi, where I am from, and with a purpose to build a parallel nonprofit in India. Eben and I were committed to a nonprofit structure, which was parallel to the organization in the United States, even though that in India wasn't necessarily the structure one would have chosen or picked up. As, and we understood that SFLC's primary activity in the United States was direct representation of free software authors and distributors. That wasn't likely to be the case for some time in India. And that couldn't have been the primary work when we just started. Evan has big ideas and big dreams and says, okay, we're gonna do it. And then I don't know how, but they magically happen. But, uh, and I was told, well, go create it, and remember, when we show up, the situation changes, and for the better, so don't fail. And no pressure at all, I landed there, and we started doing something. Uh, there weren't a lot of free software projects which were headquartered in India that time, or were releasing software which was primarily meant for consumption of Indian audience. And, or they were just releasing under Indian copyright law, under the Bern Convention, there wasn't so much going on. There were a few things there. There was a free software foundation, India, which existed, and there were a lot of developers who were contributing, but none of these projects were headquartered there. So SFLC.in began with the goal of capacity building for legal support in the Indian free software movement. And it actually started even before 2010. The first event which we did where the entire Supreme Court of India and uh, Attorney General of India and everybody showed up was a Red Hat event in 2006. And that's where we started our efforts of getting Red Hat in all the courts, the federal as well as the Supreme Court of India. And that was a celebration and talk about it. Evan was there, the law minister of the country was there. That's when it started. But the organization as a legal entity come, came into existence in 2010. It's an independently run organization. It has its own board, and I am and still remain the volunteer executive director of that organization. I started as the director of international practice here in New York, and now I'm the legal director. And I have uh, yet to become a million miler, but I'll get there. And I run, I go, I go back and forth. I have a shuttle bus service between New York and New Delhi, if anyone needs travel advice, uh, please can contact me later. And um, many people who work with me, my great team here, always hear me talking all the time or at least twice uh, from my office where I run things remotely wherever I am. And we have now a team of seven lawyers in India, all based in New Delhi and uh, three administrative staff and five volunteers spread around in the rest of the country, including Bangalore, Bombay and Cochin. So that's now what, so it, in fact, what we have built is now there are, two, there is also or the, these two organizations which run independently but in close cooperation. We also had to figure out that time, what is it that strategically the most important things to do during the years that everyone will show up? And in India, having suddenly realized, this happens to India all the time. Everybody discovers incredible India every few years. And it's their own discovery and its own different thing. 
and uh, we're becoming used to it. So, of course, now what we thought here in the 21st century, when it becomes the most important place where software is going to be made, distributed, consumed, everybody will come, and what are we going to do that time? Now, so in that sense, this fifth anniversary of SFLC.IN that we celebrate this year is the first year of SFLC.IN's business of leading you all in India, the way SFLC's predecessor, Eben and Richard's unnamed Free Software Foundation, Columbia Law School legal, legal initiative practice, led you into free software everywhere else. So what have we been doing? What we have done is been building the ground floor so that you can come and build all your big buildings on top of it. And we have built a platform which we are all going to use now. It has been absolutely crucial to, to the protection of free software movement, the opportunities which we had in India. First thing what we did and have spent our time on is fighting the patent wars in India. In India, the Patent Act is a little different, and pharmaceutical companies will tell you that about pharmaceuticals, but also about software. Software is not patentable subject matter. Software, per se, is not patentable in India. But every now and then, some clever things happen, because there are many lawyers in the world, and they are very, very clever, and there are many companies in the world, so we have fought those wars one and a half times, and now we are back to the battlefield. So as we speak right now, my team is watching, but also working on rewriting some of the guidelines to be given to the patent office to reverse what they're trying to do. So the patent wars in India, we thought we'd succeeded, but at them again. Next, what we did was work towards the opportunity of false preference in government acquisition. We started long ago. Companies like Red Hat were already there, successful, and we worked with them. But we were all it, with community, with other parties, saying, telling the government, you know what, this is a very, very good idea. But like Keith has this problem, when you have something very good to sell, then everybody's asking, yeah, seriously, what is in there for me there? So it's not an easy process, but so many years ago, and I am older than I look, I would want to believe that at least, but we started talking with the BJP government, which is now in power. We worked with every political party which would talk to us to understand, tell them why free and open source software is the way to go. We worked constantly with them, and now that we see them in power, what we have is an actual policy of the Indian government which mandates there has to be free and open source software in every e-governance project. That is a success. It's not going to be easy because having a policy is different. Getting implementation is an entirely different story. So we're again at it. We fought the ODF wars in India very, very interestingly with Bureau of Indian Standards and every other party. Again, many of the community parties, commercial, non-commercial, will remember what happened during those times. We've done that. What happened was that we, what we got was credibility. We built that credibility with Department of Electronics and Information Technology so that they would want to at least ask us, hey, what do you think about this policy? Do you have an opinion? Maybe we should listen to you? So that is what we did. Intermediaries, big North American intermediaries, built completely on free and open source software, including many companies we don't usually agree with. Their legal posi position in India was, uh, you know what, we make money, but we're not really here. We're not. Just close your eyes. You want us to follow the law? We're not here. We're in California. So what we did for them was that we fought. We brought in litigation, identified partners, clients, went to the Supreme Court, and actually won a constitutional case. That case, this year, March 2015, marks a seminal judgment, which is going to shape the free speech and expression and law of internet in India for the next 50 years. That came out from the Supreme Court. I will accept that applause. It was a lot of work, and we are very proud. So thank you very much. What else did we do? We carried out demonstrations of the connection between technology policy and surveillance, publishing the only, the only comprehensive report on communication surveillance in India. 
it is a part of the CLE material. If you feel like all of these things are documented, including the Supreme Court judgment, the report on intermediaries liability, communication surveillance, and the relationship between why free software is the thing to go wherever you are, whether in the government, outside, or wherever. Then we did was another thing, which is build community. Just get many parties to work together to see and watch people how they had used the free and open source movement to make a different movement, which is the internet freedom movement, and then bring all of those people together to talk about issues as now they will impact various people in India. Now that all of you have recognized that India is the place, it's the fourth corner after North America, Europe, China in internet governance and global internet policy. It's the forefront of issues like network neutrality and fundamental architectural issues. It is the so center of software making, at least on the integration scale, and has a whole software industry which is going to be transformed because Microsoft's movement from selling packet software to being a cloud service offering in competition with those very companies it helped create and has turned into a giant operation. This is the moment when Tata Consultancy Services, which sponsors the New York Marathon, Infosys, Wipro, and the other remaining members of that sector are now dealing with a different Microsoft that never delivers a customer to them for anything. They have enormous opportunities and enormous challenges. They have grown very fat and sluggish and are now waking up to free software. They also have woken up to the need to protect themselves from over-patenting, as a consequence of which India is the great growth area, not only for SFLC, but our partnership with Open Invention Network, with whom we've already started many activities, to increase the global patent defense of free software. These are the things which we have done in India. And so if you still think there is something going on in that part of the world, it's maybe attractive, maybe not, come talk to us. And I want to just end my remarks with something which is I'm being borrowed from someone else who talks about India in this book called The Weight of Heaven. And she says, India, she now knew, would not be content staying in the background was nobody's wallpaper, insisted in interjecting itself into everyone's life, meddling with it, twisting it, molding it beyond recognition. India, she had found, was a place of political intrigue and economic corruption, a place occupied by real people with their necessity and incessant human needs, desires, ambitions, and aspirations, and not the exotic, spiritual, mysterious entity that was a creation of everyone else's imagination. So come there. It is incredible. Thank you. Uh, questions and uh, uh, objections, celebratory comments? Michael. Technology cross license in history is OIN. How many how many licensees do you now have? Eighteen hundred and fifty. Thanks. I thought from the time I started working with Richard Stallman in nineteen ninety three that the basic job that we were pursuing was reducing the friction by increasing the peace. The friction was mostly created by rules against sharing, which we were deliberately breaking, not by breaking other people's locks, but by building uh, our own software to share. And as John Sullivan pointed out in his remarks, this is now uh, uh, not merely uh, an act of, uh, 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 of advocacy, but one of the world's greatest conceptual art projects that has ever existed. We had an idea. 
uh, the idea was best expressed in software that would change the world by sharing. Uh, that happened. Uh, but in doing so, as Keith said in his remarks, what we created was a culture uh, of peace, that is to say, a culture of mutual reinforcement and structured collaboration and competition, which um, Richard and I always assumed could be achieved in copyright by hacking it, uh, and which we assumed could not be achieved in patent very easily. Uh, as I mentioned in the essay you have in the printed materials, when um, we began working on GPL-3 in 2006, I, I, I got Richard an interview with Steve Lohr of the New York Times, who back then worked almost exclusively on the Microsoft beat. This was back last decade when Microsoft was worth a beat for the New York Times. You will notice that we have changed matters there, too, by showing up. Um, uh, so Steve was interviewing Richard, and I was sitting listening on an extension in another room, and Steve said to Richard, Richard, when, when you first started this, did you ever think it could get this big? And Richard said, no, of course not. From the moment I heard that software patenting was going to exist in the United States, I assumed we were doomed. Eben was more optimistic. Uh, I, I was. I mean, I thought one thing that could happen was U.S. patent law could change. Uh, I did not think that we could just rely upon changing U.S. patent law. There were various things in the way, including a statute known as the Federal Courts Improvement Act, which is the most misnamed piece of legislation in the history of the world. It created the Federal Circuit, which was not actually an improvement to the Federal Courts. Um, and, 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 and so I did think that we might eventually make headway in changing patent doctrine, uh, but I wasn't sure that that was even possible, let alone that it would happen in time. And Richard did, as he said later on, assume that we were doomed. Um, what, what we thought about again and again was how to have a free software patent pool. That is to say, how to try to use cooperation uh, in ownership in this very long-term exclusivist propertization of ideas system we call patent. Some way that we could generate enough leverage to get people not to attack by having some ammunition to swing back. We had no idea how to do this. We spent years talking about all kinds of things we would like to do, and then we went and did the ones we could figure out how, and this was not one of them. Uh, OIN is the answer to a prayer in that sense. It's, the, it, 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 it's how we escaped doom. Uh, what happened was that companies that came to have large investment stakes in free software at the beginning of the 21st century, IBM above all others, but by no means all by itself, realized that the thing Richard and I wanted, they wanted too. It was not possible for Richard or for me or for us, but it was possible for them. Um, Keith is modest. Uh, he talks about the opportunity to join OIN when he did three years into OIN's 10. Um, it, maybe it was for him an opportunity, but for us it was salvation. OIN did not exactly begin flying straight. Um, it took some work to make it happen, and that work was mostly Keith's. What we have wound up with, as uh, Michael Cunningham in his adroit cross-examination just demonstrated, uh, is one great big pile of ammunition and a lot of money. Um, and Keith has used it with extraordinary skill, that big pile of patents and that lot of money. We have, we have watched together, uh, him and me, as, as things that I did not think could be done could be done, like taking a big bunch of patents and passing them to a guy and saying, oh, Microsoft is suing you, huh? You might want to borrow this. Uh, and, and then Keith lends him two or three nuclear weapons, and then, you know, peace breaks out. Um, uh, deterrence has been uh, Keith's specialty, not only, I suppose, as a U.S. diplomat in Japan, but also uh, as the head of OIN. He's very good at it, and he has deterred a lot of trouble. One of my difficulties in the free software community, of course, is that I represent clients uh, who think that patents are wrong when applied to software, uh, and that's the line I follow when I speak for them, because I represent them. Uh, then, of course, uh, reality breaks out. We can't just live there. We all know we can't just live there or we're doomed, as Richard said. Uh, everything that is practically possible uh, in keeping us from being eaten by patent warfare, we got because OIN helped us get it. Uh, and then, of course, the U.S. Supreme Court changed U.S. patent law. 
Uh, we, we showed up in green covers every time we could uh, for the course of the last 15 years. We told the Supreme Court again and again why they really ought to take back control of patent law from the federal circuit. Uh, and then uh, in a series of cases from Bilski through Prometheus to Alice Corp against the State Street Bank, the Supreme Court showed up. I can't say that we have achieved perfect simplicity and that the Supreme Court has told us that you can't patent claims in software unless you have a special purpose machine or a transformation of matter, but I can tell you that they will continue never to be able successfully to identify a third case. We have a patent law now which is within spitting distance of what we can live with. And all the patent law in the United States that we have has been practically moderated by OIN's effort to reduce friction by increasing the peace. The metric on this is actually pretty simple. We've just finished uh, the hottest phase in a $35 billion patent war that has consumed our industry. It has produced all kinds of wonderful paydays for patent lawyers around the world over who owns bounce back scrolling and other very important technical issues on which the fate of society depends. In the course of all that war with all this hot metal flying around everywhere and people trying to decapitate one another at billion dollar levels, no free software project has been sued, no free software has been enjoined, nowhere in the world have we been unable to figure out some relationship between law and the practicalities of patent combat that Keith has so carefully managed that didn't allow us to escape free. Now I think we are passing into a second period in that war. Uh, I think truces are about to break out. I think that's necessary because the cloud has happened to everybody except the Apple Computer Corp. The degree of technical interdependency that that involves means, I believe, that we are going to see parties begin to cycle back. There are going to be truces, and anybody who has ever been through war will tell you that once the truces take hold, it is very difficult to go back to war. I therefore believe that by the time we're all together in this room again, even if that's next year, this date, we will have seen a transformation of the patent combat now going on towards peace. And the sh struggle we will be in will have shifted towards winning that peace, which I believe that OIN is also the crucial instrument to do. Keith owns Versailles. When we all get ready to make the peace that ends this war, we will be sitting at his table. It is OIN that will be the place where the treaty of peace for patent peace in free software and the IT industry will be made. And therefore, I am very glad there are all those mirrors there and all of that. I look forward to attending the peace conference. It's nice real estate. We just need to get them to the table as quick as we can. We will not succeed in getting them to the table fast enough. Three and a half years ago, I began to say to people, well, that's great. The U.S. patent system is a total mess. We're going to fix it for you. And then you're going to have to deal with the fact that the world's biggest patent system isn't going to be in the United States anymore. The world's biggest patent system is going to be in the People's Republic of China, and it is going to operate not under the rule of law. Teaching the world's largest patent system not to operate like the American patent system in the sense of not having the rule of law, but having the American patent system and software and all of those other things claimed under it is a disaster unfolding before our eyes. The patent war we have lived through so far is an economic struggle largely by the world's largest incumbents in the IT industry then, Microsoft and Apple, to stop time, to freeze their respective industries, the smartphone industry and the server computing industry and the desktop in the PC, uh, and to prevent various forms of technical uh, erosion of their incumbency. That's the patent war now burning out. The patent war now starting up is a geopolitical struggle among societies. And it does not have the same tractable characteristics. Tractable, I'm actually saying that about the, the mess we have just survived. Compared to where we are going, it was tractable. Uh, it was tractable to him, uh, and with some effort in 
green sleeved briefs and other places, we could add to that tractability. That is to say, we really did think we had something to contribute to reducing friction by increasing the piece. I'm not sure that we have what it would take to reduce friction by increasing the peace in a global geopolitical struggle over patenting. That is, I don't think we would if we didn't have India. What Mishi is doing is constructing, as she said, the fourth corner uh, in the geopolitics of patents and software in the 21st century, and I like the corner she is building for us. It is partly the technical excellence of the way that we have treated the controller of patents and the other parts of the Indian government. It is partly the level of a commitment that we demonstrated to working in their environment. The most interesting meeting I have ever had with a standards organization in the world occurred in New Delhi during the ODF wars uh, that Mishi referred to when she and I walked in there and sat down at the table and senior bureaucrats in the room basically said, do you know how much Microsoft has bribed us to be on the other side from you? We, we hear you might have some understanding about that. Now, of course, if you're the, 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 the white guy in the room, you make all kinds of mistakes, as the white guy in the room in Delhi earlier this week, Mark Zuckerberg, made all kinds of mistakes. Um, he, he, he doesn't have the good sense, you see, to keep his white face in the background. And I, I've been very lucky about that. I, I, I didn't have to make that mistake. I had a perfect representative in India. That, that took a long part of looking on my part, scanning the seats in the law school classrooms looking for the right party, and she was it. What we have now is the beginning of the ability to influence geopolitics through the demand of the largest democracy on earth to have equality and opportunity in technology. What we have now is the opportunity to take a society in which 12-year-old girls really are encouraged to learn Ruby on Rails, okay? It may not be the, a non-misogynist society in many ways, but trust me, you walk into the bedroom of a middle-class 12-year-old girl in New Delhi and you, there's Ruby on Rails there. Making software or being a doctor are the two good outcomes for career opportunity. You'll meet what that produces and what it can do to global IT in just a few minutes. What we're going to have is a place in which we have built conceptual and legal and operational machinery that can actually swing enough weight in the world to offset other entire societies that do not care as much about freedom. None of that would be possible if we were a bunch of white people sitting around in San Francisco or New York or Frankfurt or London making these plans. This is only possible because that's a democratic society and these are the people whom it is made for. What, what has been achieved in India in a short period of time is absolutely remarkable. I'm the guy who watches it. I'm the guy who schemed to make it possible and it's, it, it goes beyond what I thought could be done. It hasn't cost very much either. After all, it's India. Um, what, what, what we're celebrating then is that increasing the peace is no longer a marginal job. When Richard and I started, we, we, we did not know a lot of other people who knew that that peace could be there. There were an awful lot of people who knew it was impossible. If I counted the number of law professors over the years who have told me that free software couldn't exist because there's no incentive to make it, I would count a lot of law professors. Uh, a thing I try never to do, it's very frightening. Um, what, 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 what has happened looked impossible for theoretical reasons uh, to other people. It often looked impossible to me for social reasons. It isn't. Uh, there is a structure which unifies uh, the companies with which Keith deals and the developers with whom Mishi deals and the governments with whom we all deal. And that structure really has come to be the one in which we reduce friction by increasing the peace and everybody loves the outcome, or at least almost everybody. These, these birthdays are together, summing them over and dividing by three. These are the birthdays of that reality about 21st century structures of political economy and technology. The fighting's not over. In some respects, the most important fighting has only just begun. Uh, but the mechanisms whereby we do what it takes to win the peace are now mature. And this maturity is the maturity that you've seen here. We have uh, other things to do this afternoon, and, and coffee is one of them. But more questions? Yes. By all means.
You got it? Yes. Great. Good. Thanks. You mentioned the coming, coming war in China. Could you just highlight a few of the aspects of what you see as might occur in that regard? I will repeat comments I have made before in order to avoid saying anything new about tricky business. Um, uh, uh, in, in 2013, uh, Mishi and I were in Shenzhen listening to the chief patent lawyer for a very large East Asian manufacturer headquartered there. Uh, and we were getting a good morning, let's mutually introduce one another presentation. Uh, and uh, the gentleman put up some slides in which he says, uh, last year we applied for 32,000 patents and we got 29,312. Also, uh, we applied for 2,200 US patents and we got 1,400. And Mishi nudged me and she said, so those are just some kind of Chinese patents. And I said, pay attention. You were about to get a lecture on the virtues of reciprocal patent licensing. After which the gentleman, who is a very smart patent lawyer, uh, swung into the lecture on reciprocal patent licensing. And he said, reciprocal patent licensing is the way of the future and we at Company X totally believe in reciprocal patent licensing and we are talking to all our supply chain and related companies all over South China and telling them about the importance of reciprocal patent licensing. And we finished our various business in Shenzhen and I got on an airplane and flew to San Francisco for a meeting of the Linux Foundation Member Council at which I was scheduled to give a two hour talk on the then right in the middle patent war. And I said then, and will now say again in response to the question, well gentlemen and ladies congratulations, you've driven your patents up to a million and a half dollars a piece. In fact, I said I saw a guy transact a patent last month for a million dollars. There was an expired patent, which of course it was because there was three years of royalty collection left. And some of my dearest friends present in the room were then selling armaments with both hands into the patent war at very high prices. There were, nobody had ever seen prices like this before. I said, congratulations, you've driven your patents up to a million and a half a piece. It's great. You're going to make a ton of money. Here's your problem. There's a man somewhere else in the world who can make patents for 15 cents a piece. And his patents will mean whatever his courts say they mean, and his courts will say they mean whatever he wants them to mean, because he has a telephone on his desk that goes to a guy, and the guy has a telephone that calls the judges, and it means whatever he says it means. I said, that man is going to offer you a great opportunity. He's going to offer you the opportunity of reciprocal patent licensing, one for one. And if you don't want to do that, then you don't have to be in his society where he has quite a lot of people and they buy a lot of stuff and you would like to make money there. So that's what's going to happen to you. And after that talk, one of the senior patent lawyers in one of the operations who is not here in the room came up to me and said, so in which country does this man exist? And I said, well, start with the societies with three billion people in them and work from there. Um, that's what this means, okay? What it means is we want technology transfer. Uh, we would get it by stealing it if we had to, uh, but it would be easier to trade it with you. So over here we have a hat full of rights that we just made yesterday for nothing at all. Uh, and those rights are really good state-granted monopolies that last a very long time in a very large economy. Why, why don't you trade with us? And by the way, we have antitrust investigations, and we have regulatory structures, and we have rules we would like about backdoors in the servers, and there's all kinds of stuff that we would like, so you should trade with us. That's where we're headed. If you like that, then you're them. If you don't like that, then we need a whole lot more clout in a hell of a hurry. And it exists not just at the level of patent law, and it exists not just where Keith and I are now, it exists at the government to government level, and don't count on that to work. Anybody else? Let's do something else. Thank you very much.